Today we're going to just immediately jump into and run the Flex operating system on this Altair 680. This is the second video in a series about running Flex on the 680. If you haven't watched the previous video, that's the one where we show how we got Flex up and running on this. I'd really recommend watching that first for the background. I put a link to the whole playlist for the 680 series in the information below the video. Now in addition, if you want more information about Flex, I also put a link to the Southwest Technical Products 6800 computer video playlist as well. That one contains several videos about Flex so you can learn more about it. All right, let's go ahead and get this turned on. Power, alt, reset, run. Turn on the disk drives. We're gonna use two disks, a boot disk and then a data disk. All right, the monitor, uh, is up and running. That's the dot prompt you see there. If I can get the screen in right. All right, now to boot the disk, I had to create a boot prompt like I mentioned in the previous video. It's at FC00. So when I jump to the boot ROM, it goes out to track zero on the disk and loads sectors one and two. Sectors one and two contain the cold boot loader for flex. Once those are loaded, it boot ROM jumps to it and the cold boot loader then goes out to the uh, file system on the disk and loads the file that contains the image of Flex to load into memory. Um, I think I named it DOS.sys, although you can point it to different files out there. Um, once Flex is loaded, it does initialization and then it goes out to the file system and looks for a file called startup.txt. That's just basically the same thing as an auto exec.bat file over in the DOS world. Not as sophisticated, but it allows you to do some startup commands. This verify is off is coming from a startup.txt file I have, for example. And I'll show you that file in just a minute. All right, the three pluses is the prompt from Flex. One of the first things you probably want to do is do a directory of the disk. That's a catalog command. And as you see, it's a single column of files, just sort of like CPM 1.4 was. Um, and on CPM 1.4, people wrote better looking directory programs that went across the screen instead of just down. And people did the same thing for Flex as well, of course. But this is what came with Flex 1. All right, you'll notice there's a lot of .cmd files. Those are command files. If you type in anything without an extension, it goes out and it tries to find that file name with a .cmd. And so that's pretty much how all commands are implemented in Flex. There really aren't any intrinsic commands other than, for example, the monitor command just jumps back out to the monitor. I can jump back into Flex with the warm start vector there at 7103. All right, to look at uh, another drive, you go cat and then specify a drive number. Instead of using ABCD like in CPM, it uses drive 0123. So here we're looking at our second disk. You can see I have just a few files on this. This is gonna be our work disk that we'll look at in just a minute. Uh, you can do wildcards. Uh, show me anything that starts with C. You notice you don't have to do the, uh, the, the asterisk on there. You can delete files, del cat2.command. Um, it makes you explicitly type it out and it double verifies. So it's wanting to make sure you don't delete anything by mistake. Um, copy command is a lot like pip. It can do all sorts of things, pretty flexible, including copy an entire disk to another disk file by file. You can explicitly copy one file, for example, cat.command to cat2.command. Um, obviously I've done this before because that's the one I just deleted. After that completes, we have cat2 out here. And of course, it's just a copy of cat, so it does the exact same thing. Um, you can copy it to another drive as well. So I can copy cat.command over to drive one, cat.command. And that's the nomenclature for that. Now, if you forget to type it in ahead of time, you can actually put dot one at the end and do it as well. That comes in handy now and then when you forget to type it. So now if I look over on drive one, you can see we have our com cat command. And I can explicitly run it from over there by typing one dot cat. Now you notice that the commands are all running from drive zero, that reference drive zero. Um, so you might be wondering, okay, that's sort of like the A, B, where you have a default drive in CPM. So how would I make one my default drive? Well, Flex doesn't quite do it that way. Instead, it uses the concept of a system disk and a work disk, sort of like CPM3 added uh, a little bit later. If I use the assign command, I can see what the current assignment is. Both of them are currently assigned to drive zero, like, you, like we've been seeing. What I, can do, what I can do is assign the work drive to be one. 
So now you see that I have a system drive of zero and a work drive of one. What this means is that any command I type, it's gonna to go to the system drive, drive zero, to try to find it and load it. Then when a program uses a file, for example, let's say we wanted to assemble something or list something, the, uh, the file name you specified a list is always gonna come from the work drive and the program itself doesn't have to worry about that. It just does the open and flex takes care of where it actually comes from. And this comes in kind of handy in that um, now you have just a single drive that uses your boot drive that has all, or disk I should say, that has all your commands on it. And then on your working disk where you have basic programs or assembly programs or word, process, word processing, you don't waste any space on it for all the various commands you might need because it automatically would go to drive zero for it. It's a pretty clean solution and lets you make efficient use of your data disks, especially back in a time when these five and a quarter inch disks um, only held about 74K of user space. Now these eight inch drives I'm using, I'm getting over three times that, so it's not quite as critical. Right, so now if I type cat, it's gonna go to drive zero to load cat and then cat is gonna say, what drive do you want me to list? It's always gonna list the work drive, which is now one. So as you're working and you do cat, chances are it's, it's the work drive that you want to look at, and so it's doing what we intuitively want. Let's say I wanted to list this selector.txt file. It's gonna go and load list from drive zero, and then selector, it's gonna automatically take it from drive one, just like I would intuitively expect. So let's just watch this real quick here. What you'll see is when I hit return, we're coming off of drive zero to load it, and then drive one to get the selector.txt data file. And so this works most of the time and does what you think it should be doing. Um, and of course, you can always override it with explicit drive designators. All right, now the .txt extension is used uh, for assembly source files. It's used for um, command files, you know, like, uh, they were called submit files in CPM. Here they're, they're exec files. Um, so a lot of things assume the .txt extension. So I can just say list selector and it automatically assumes the txt extension. The editor does the same thing. Um, for example, one of the programs I had here is hello. Hello.txt is an assembly language program. The, the uh, convention was to use .txt for assembly language. So I can edit this hello world program. It's, right now it's on drive zero loading edit. It's a big program, it takes a good while. Uh, once it gets edit loaded, okay, now it's over on drive one loading our hello source file. And I can print that or look at it from line one, print through 99 in the end. So here's our hello world program that we were demonstrating in the workspace videos earlier. Uh, we're running at 100 now. Let's go ahead and change this. Instead of saying Altair 680, let's say something different for Flex. To replace the line, you just give it the line number and say it equals, and the new content, let's say uh, hello, hello world from flex 1.0. All right, oops, uppercase. All right, so now you see our message is hello world from flex. S command to save, writes it back out to disk. And if you look, you'll see that it's created um, a backup file as well as the new one. To assemble this, I run the assembler, ASMB, and give it the source file name. It's gonna assume .txt. And again, it's gone to drive zero to get me assem, and it's pulled my source file off of the work disk. Again, my work disk stays nice and clean. All right, so here's the output of that assembly. Um, it's look, generating the symbol table right now. All right, that's all done. If I could type around this tripod, okay. So we have the backup file and our source file and it created a .bin file. This is an executable file. It didn't call it .cmd because that's like the final version you want and we don't want to overwrite it possibly. Now, one nice thing about um, Flex is you can execute a file even if it doesn't have a .cmd extension. In uh, CPM, for example, you couldn't execute a file unless it was a .com. But here I can execute it just by giving the full file name, including the extension. Now notice I had to put the drive one in here, and that's because it would only look for this in drive zero. Now in Flex 2 and the newer versions, it would actually search drive zero, and if it's not there, then go on to your work disk. But anyway, so our hello world is doing um, the message we expected. So let's go ahead and copy this to drive zero. So let's copy hello.bin 
0.hello.command. And now when I type hello, it's running it off of drive zero. And there's our hello world. All right, we also have basic on this computer. Takes, uh, it takes a good while to load, um, about 10, 11 seconds for loading less than 10K. Consider that we loaded 24K in just four seconds. You can see um, our workspace routines were pretty efficient. All right, so this is, um, this is locked up. Not a very good demonstration, or is it still thinking? All right, well, I'm not gonna start this whole thing over. I gotta go figure out why it's locked up. So I'm not really sure what happened there. I'm not able to replicate the problem. Never really ran across that same thing in the past. So just chalk it up to the gremlins that were part of computing back at this time in history. So let's go ahead and run basic again. This is actually provided by Southwest Technical Products themselves. This is basically the same version they were shipping um, on cassette and then later on disc with their first operating system called FDOS. FDOS was a very primitive DOS, kind of like um, North Star DOS. And it was what was shipping with their five and a quarter inch disk drive for the first six to nine months until Flex came out. And so they just changed the load and save routines to, load, to use uh, uh, Flex instead of FDOS. Flex was just dramatically better than FDOS. And once they started shipping Flex, they never really shipped FDOS again. All right, so we're loading Lunar Lander. That was one of the programs out here on our disk. You can see it's a good sized program. Now the one down, downside about uh, Southwest Technical's own basic is that it was slow. And the reason it was slow, and we've demonstrated this in some of the videos in the Southwest Technical computer series I did, is because it did floating point arithmetic in decimal. Software did it in decimal carrying nine digits of significance the whole time. So it was very accurate. If you needed to do any math or anything, especially additions, um, you had a much better significant figures than you did in single point resolution floating point like was used by MIT. So you typically only had six or seven digits of significant figures in that case. So it was easy if you were adding large numbers to lose digits, um, especially if you're doing math, for example, I mean uh, accounting, for example. Uh, but again, the downside was that it was a bit slow, and we can see that in some of the comparisons. All right, so here's our Lunar Lander program. If you watch it cursor zip across here, you can kind of see it. it is, it's slow. It's doing some calculations there to figure out how far off the ground you are. And that's the floating point utility is just being a little slow. But again, it's a trade-off. All right, so now to get back to Flex, you type DOS. That's a remnant from uh, the FDOS days when TSC finally provided their own basic with this, which they did in later versions of Flex. The command to get back to DOS was Flex, like you might expect. All right, let's take a look at uh, catalog on drive zero. If you need to pause the long display, you can hit the escape button. I just pushed it and the display is paused. Hit it again and it resumes. Uh, and you can change that character with the TTY set command. Um, speaking of which, in our startup file, let's take a look at that. This is the file that um, got, oops. This is the file that got executed when we booted. First thing it did is run the verify program and said off. That says turn off disk write verification. The colon is a command separator. It's like having another line in the file. Now the startup.txt file has to be one line. Well, there's a way to get around that. I'll show you that in just a second. So then I ran the TTY set command, and the only thing I changed was things that are different than the default. So I set nulls to zero. I'm not on the teletype. Don't want to waste those extra nulls. And I set the tab character to be nine. I forget what it was originally. But you can set other things, including what that pause character is. Some people would set it to spacebar because it's easier to hit. Some people would set it to control S because that's what they were used to on uh, CPM, for example. All right, so let's say you wanted to do a more complex startup file. You could do that because you can create command files. Um, you could go into the editor and make one, or you can use this shortcut they give you called build, which is an easy way to make a um, text file. Let's, call, let's create something called stat. Uh, we'll run the assign command. If you run the assign with no parameters, then it, um, it just echoes the current setting. Uh, basically, build, by the way, is just letting us type in a text file without going into the editor. Uh, let's run the TTY set command. With no parameters, it just shows you all the current settings. Um, let's go ahead and, this, this is a status command. Let's go ahead and just list the startup.txt file. Again, you don't have to have the TXT. 
Um, and then finally, let's run our hello world program that we moved over here. To terminate input, you put a pound sign. So now let's see what we have there. Okay, so we display the current drive assignments. We display the current TTY settings. These are basically console parameters. List the startup text file so we can see it is, and then run our hello program. So to run a text file that is command, you use the execute command. So I just say execute stat. Oops. Okay, system drive is zero, work drive is one. That was the ASN command. Here's all the settings from TTY set. Um, obviously, I typed the startup file in wrong because I couldn't find it. And then there's our hello world there. So these are various things. Except with the backspace characters, what delete is, end of line is the colon that we use to separate the commands. Um, here's the escape character. Right now it's set to escape, but you can set it to space or something else if you wanted. What did I type in instead of startup.txt? Oh, I have to do this zero dot startup because I had the, um, God, I can't type around this tripod. Because I had the assignment setting the work drive one, that's why I couldn't find startup. All right, but that gives you an idea of some of the other things that you can do. Finally, I'd like to demonstrate this P command that you see here. If you proceed any command with the letter P, which will run the, the P command, it will actually route whatever would have gone to the screen to the system printer. And that program doesn't have to know anything about it. Flex does it for you. So if I wanted to list the uh, selector file that we've looked at, but instead have it go to the printer, I just use this syntax right here. Now the printer we're gonna use today is routed through the 6850 on this uh, UIO board, this ends up being the connector going out. And what we're going to use is this Model 15 teletype, which is World War II vintage from the 1940s. I have the cover off it now so we can actually see it work. You might have remembered from the previous video what it looked like with the cover. That's the cover back there. But it's a lot more fun to watch this thing work. So I'm going to just shut up and let you watch this for a while as it prints. You may think there's no way that uh, more teletype noise would be a pleasant thing, but this is a different story than the Model 33 we've been using. I'm going to go hit return. That's what a Model 15 teletype looks like and how it works. It's kind of a, a mesmerizing sound for me. Um, now that Model 15 was developed back in the day long before there was ASCII communication or RS-232. In fact, it's a 5-bit communication and the signaling voltages are well over 100 volts. So nothing that a, a computer would be uh, accustomed to handling. So in order to make this all work, I've had to build this interface board you see down there in the dark. Let me see if I can get a better view. There it is. So that phone wire coming in is actually RS-232 data. And those big quarter inch jacks are the high voltage 5-bit um, data going in and out of the, of the teletype. All right. Well, that does it for this video. Uh, we have Flex up and running. And um, if you want to see more of Flex and learn a bit more about it, again, Take a look in the information below the video where I have a link to the 6800 Southwest Technical Video Series. And there I have uh, about three videos or so on Flex that goes into more detail.